You mentioned that it takes courage and commitment to be an authentic leader. What are the benefits from heart-led generous acts? I had a colleague who's a black uh, partner at PCG, a leader, <clears throat> and he was telling me that he's afraid to say, I don't know. So I just won't tell, say, I don't know to people, Joe. Hmm. Well, they're going to say, hey, you know, sir, what do you think we should do? And before he has to say, I don't know, guess what? He leaves the room. And so one time he said, enough is enough. And he said, you know, I don't know either. And he said, it was like a breath of fresh air came into the room. The energy went up. Oh, I see. Well, he's willing to, or she's willing to admit they're stuck. I guess I commit I'm stuck and, um, you know, off you go. So I think that is the biggest power of now, of course, you also humanize yourself, the ability to free others by exposing some of yourself. It's okay to be afraid. Let me get those fears out and figure out how to solve them so I can move, move forward. You are listening to Personalization Outbreak, a podcast about the collapse of traditional corporate standards in today's more personalized world. I'm Glenn Yopis. I'm a leadership strategist, author, contributor to Forbes, and founder of the Leadership in the Age of Personalization movement. On this show, I'm interviewing executives across multiple sectors to find out how the balance between standardization and personalization can exist. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Personalization Outbreak Podcast. Organizations and their leaders are experiencing a unique dilemma. You see, employees are now consumers, and they expect more freedom in the ways they work based upon their own realities and values as individuals. Now, on the other hand, organizations lack the readiness to cultivate inclusive work environments to handle a multi-generational workforce that is fueled with differences in the ways they work, act, and innovate. Now, here's the question. Should organizations and their leaders see this dilemma as a threat or an opportunity? Now, to help us understand the unique growth opportunity this dilemma creates, our guest today is Joe Davis, author of the book, The Generous Leader, Seven Ways to Give Yourself for Everyone's Gain. Man, I love that book title. See, Joe is also the Managing Director and Senior Partner at Boston Consulting Group, and he currently serves as the Chair of the Board of Trustees at his alma mater, Whitman College. Now, before we get started, please click the like button below, share it with your colleagues, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and social media at Glenn Yopis. Joe, I have to tell you before I welcome you, from the moment you and I prep for this call and the dialogue we've had, you're just a wonderful human being. And I really appreciate uh, the time that you're taking uh, to share your story today. So welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Glenn. That's that's such a nice opening that now I feel very warm and ready, ready to go, you know, because you're just... Uh... Well, we're, we're ready for blast off here. So let, let's jump into this, Joe. You know, in your book, you state that to run a successful business, you need people, obviously, right? But <laughs> people you. today, people today want leaders who can and well will work beyond themselves, work to see beyond themselves and only the bottom line. I mean, what a novel concept. And I know it's always about the numbers, but you believe that leaders must learn to lead with their hearts and connecting with people will not only allow leaders to grow professionally and personally, but will also allow the businesses that they lead to thrive. Now, Joe, before you jump into this one, and I know this is a pretty weighty one, yes. help us understand how this works. Because we come from this standardized world where it's always about the numbers. And by the way, I get that. But why do you think that there's more? And what is fundamentally changed Okay, that's there's a lot of questions there. So cut me off if I go too long with that. No, no, you go, Joe. We're gonna have some pieces fun. of it. I will actually. I mean, I deeply believe what you just said. I mean, you said it's about the people, and I'm glad you said obviously because otherwise that's a big duh. I mean, I always used to not understand when the annual reports would not the CEO or whomever would always talk about it's all about my people. And when you're a younger person in a place, you don't get that. Once you get later, yeah, you really understand it's only about nah, good product and all that. I got it, but it's the people that make it happen. You know, I just tell you, when I, for this book, I talked to Joaquin, a lot of executives, Joaquin Duato is the CEO of J&J. &J. Mm -hmm. He actually said this, he's 
he's over he's over 60 he's somewhere near my age you know he's been see a couple of years and he said to me a very interesting thing he said you know and i may not get exactly right what you did what how hard you work how hard you try that's all good but it doesn't matter outcomes matter as a leader outcomes matter which is what you just said but then he said now, those next parts takes maturity. The sooner you get that, the sooner you will step past yourself and listen to others and connect more fully with your teams. And the sooner you then, sorry, I'm a mosquito where I am, the sooner you will then release and be able to leverage all the human traits cr critical to get positive results. So it's pretty interesting. In there's a lot of points. Trying matters, but it does. it's not enough. You know, so we don't want the participation trophies to be the only answer. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have to get numbers, but you've got to understand those numbers come from you moving past you and engaging and, you know, inspiring and connecting with everybody on your team. So I think then your question, there's like two whys. So I think, you know, we've already said, you know, you're just not going to drive real results without everybody firing as best they can. So we, we could talk about that. Now, why is it maybe that the heart has to be more, it's always in the center, but be, you know, equal plane for, with the head and the hand, head, hands as an example. I think a couple of things have changed. You know, people say, oh, the millennials, they want new things. And some people say, man, Joe, it can't just be, that's so cliche. But it's not, I don't believe it's just the millennials. I think what, a couple of things have changed. You know, the work-life blur, it's just, you know, well, it's kind of went like this with technology, right? The podcast, I mean, not podcast, the Blackberry puts it in 1999, now you're 24-7. Laptop made it worse, the phone made it worse, and Zoom made it worse. And then, of course, the minute you throw COVID in there, now our hybrid workforce, you are work life is really blurred. And people want and expect to be seen as humans because now work is home and home is work. I mean, maybe some magic people separate them really well, but they expect to be treated and seen as a human so they can be fully inspired. And that's what's you know, the days of IBM, remember the white shirt and the blue suit, they all look the same and where everyone's, where you're a cog in the wheel, or, you know, you have a, I'm a consultant or you're a podcast host instead of I'm Joe and you're Glenn. I don't think that flies anymore. I mean, I think pe you, the leaders have to see a person as a human given. And I'll tell you one other point I'd say is, sorry, sorry the, you know, social media just exacerbated this. You and I were talking about stuff going on in the world beforehand you know there's you open the phone and you can feel bad right whatever mm. war you want to pick whatever yeah. thing going on climate it just you know tornadoes not good. you know so you really need in your full life people to engage and see you and, and understand where you're coming from um and not just think you're a cog there you know joe um i love what you said and you know a lot of time is being spent now talking about humanizing the workplace and i could respect that <laughs> but but what i also see is as much as that sounds good how do you do it so i'm going to throw something out at here and, and maybe you can just riff with me here because we do this pretty well um i ask people go ask your peers go ask your team members how do they perceive you and then ask them the follow-up question, how does that shape what they expect from you? And why do I ask that question? Because I don't think people are going to be very happy with what they're going to hear. Yeah. <laughs> because we don't know each other anymore. And it's interesting because when you and I first met, I feel like I've known you for 10 years. What is it? We don't realize that we have common goals with people, but because we have been uh, trained to perhaps judge people or perceive people the wrong way based upon how the organizations define them, not how the individual has defined itself, all of a sudden we're seeing this thing turn upside down now. Now it's about the individual and how the individual can add value to the organization in ways that maybe we, we couldn't see that before. With that in mind, again, love to get your perspective on that. Why is the being a generous leader so important? Because it seems to me that we can't get to know the individual unless we learn how to let go of ourselves. Yes. You know, it's interesting because you said when you asked that question, it's also the thing that you didn't, I think it would be a third point, which is also the person asked the question, how they will actually engage then with you going forward. And now, with, now the individual's, 
if they're really engaged in the best, will work together, you know, more effectively. Yeah, you know, I do think, I mean, generous leader, I mean, you think you saw the book, you know, I quote, I cite that as someone who gives freely of themselves without expectation of direct personal benefit so others can develop, grow, and thrive at their full potential. And if, you know, if we're believing that it's humans, there's always humans that matter. We just maybe not, you know, and actually I believe you think about AI, AI say, oh, no, no, but actually it makes it even more true because now the leader, as the cultures are affected, people have different roles, the leader really has to be there for the people. The people are primarily going to, you know, just walk. But I think that, you know, when a generous reader really sit there and thinks about that individual as someone who wants to thrive at their full potential, if you think that way, you're all your next thing you know, your thinking is changing, right? Ah, oh, so what is their full potential? What are they great at that I can help leverage? What do they need? You just start, asking, you know, what what's their experience that I don't understand that might be useful here, or that's getting their way that, you know, you can't solve their problems, but at least I can recognize and see if I can help them work through whatever the experiences are if they're in the way. Um, that's you know, that's I think it is very powerful. I think that I think and the thing that's made this more real, well, people are yearning for it people can walk from a job so the problem is you know you say well how's this practical you can say two ways one when people are really feeling recognized and feel free to to you know perform at their best duh that's going to be good for you yeah. but put it another way if people don't feel that the good ones are going to walk there are a lot of jobs out there you know we may you bet like what's unemployment for i mean there's just a lot of jobs especially for the most talented people well, and let's not forget the the new law that just was announced. I think a couple of weeks ago that now there's no such thing as a yeah. non compete. No, I mean, was... now now really everybody's a free agent now. So you, you you mentioned that it takes courage and commitment to be an authentic leader. What are the benefits from heart led generous acts? And we're going to talk about your seven acts yeah, yeah. of of a heart of a of of what a generous leader represents in a moment, but what are the benefits of really leading from your heart and well, how does me, that translate into becoming an authentic leader? Yeah. Let me tell you one or two stories. I mean, interesting story. I had a colleague who's a black uh, partner at PCG, a leader, <clears throat> and he was telling me that he's afraid to say, I don't know. So I just won't tell, say, I don't know to people, Joe, hmm. and he'll be in a team room and hmm. the team is starting to get stuck and he can feel it and he can tell they're going to say, Hey, you know, sir, what do you think we should do? And before he has to say, I don't know, guess what? He leaves the room. What he just, you know, he doesn't want to be stuck in that highly <laughs> in his mind. Cause I think, I don't know, is a pretty easy one to say, but in a highly vulnerable situation. And so one time he said, enough is enough. And he said, you know, I don't know either. And he said, it was like a breath of fresh air came into the room. The energy went up. He goes, oh, you don't know. Oh, none of us know. Well, what are we going to do? This all, how, and the brainstorming started. The creativity started. The individual innovation and group innovation started. I mean, yes, it was. So that's a simple point, which is the benefit is if you share some humanity, authenticity, on, honesty, vulnerability, you, you pick your word. They're, they're different, but they're not that different. Sure. You free others to release themselves when they're blocked. And when they're blocked, they're not doing anything good for you or for anybody. And they say, oh, I see. Well, he's willing to, or she's willing to admit they're stuck. I guess I can admit I'm stuck. And, um, you know, off you go. So I think that is the biggest power of, now, of course, you also humanize yourself, which is an indirect benefit. And then you, they feel more connected to you. But the the ability to free others by exposing some of yourself, I, I tend to tear up pretty easily. And one of my colleagues, when I was head of North America, my chief staff said, Joe, the fact that you cry just frees us all to admit we're our fears and move, you know, not directly, but you know, we just, Oh, wow. He's sure. afraid. Oh, good. It's okay to be afraid. Let me get those fears out and figure out how to solve them so I can move, move forward. So let me ask you this. I mentioned it earlier. Why is it difficult for leaders to let go? And what advice do you have for them on how to let go? Yeah. <clears throat> I've thought, you know, why is, Depends on who the leader is. Well, either I guess it doesn't matter if you're a white male, you know, you're supposed to be blah, 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 however you were raised, you know, you know, if you're a black female, oh my God, I can't show that weakness. You know, so there's, you comment on stereotypes and mm -hmm. expectations of people as always all over the place. And, you know, we all get stuck inside of those. I also think it's interesting as 
you know, I think about this when you're first, your first leader role, maybe you're running, managing two, three, four, five people. And it's like, I got to prove I can do this. I got to prove yeah. I can get results. And at two or three or four or five people, you probably can't, maybe you can do it yourself. You know, you can work all the time and whatever it is, you can write all the slide decks or you can go work on the manufacturing floor and go meet the customer. You might, but that doesn't work as you grow in the role. And it's very interesting. I think people, so I think you, you know, some of the tricks, but I think partly it, you're trained to not be that way. You're trained to think I got to prove I can do it by myself I'm on my own. So first you're afraid to show any, unless you've learned young, very young age. You know, some of the tricks, I think a couple of things suggested to me. I mean, one one leader said, Christina Sistrunk, she runs an oil, ran an oil company. She said, I always would watch if someone, other leader would be talking or something and say something honest, authentic, human, and just learn what they were doing, watch the reaction in the rooms. And now she wouldn't, she would do her own way, but she said, I just could see the power of that. Another friend of mine said, you know, think back to a time where you were in a vulnerable, quote unquote, situation. And how'd it work out? I mean, you're still here. You're still getting promoted. You're still alive. It actually worked out okay. And then use that, you know, because it's really fear that gets in your way. Use that knowledge to step over the line, your own line, whatever it is, just slightly and start to expose more of yourself. And you can do little things. Someone told me that a woman, this is maybe 20 years ago, a woman in her office, she was a woman, she would say, go pick up Johnny at school on her calendar. And everybody could see that. She goes, this was in a day, Joe, where we didn't say I have kids and I have to go get my kids at work. That was just, you know, yeah. work was not. And she's just the fact that she wrote on her calendar the name of her son and she had to go get him was very freeing. She said, that was really vulnerable. And I kind of chuckle, you probably chuckle. But she was also free. Goes, oh, this leader, and she was a leader, is saying it's okay to have a personal life. And it's okay to even tell talk about it, you know? Um, I love that, Joe. And, you know, I think that's part of where we're at now. We have to release ourselves of uh, so many burdens that we feel we have weighing on our shoulders. And I think that's part of what leadership's all about. I mean, we have to, you know, assume those burdens, at least some of them, because they're just so only so much uh, that we can handle. And I, again, I highly recommend your book. Again, you see it on the screen, The Seven ways to give yourself and everyone's gain. I know that's a subtitle. It's called The Generous Leader. Uh, seven ways to give of yourself for everyone's gain. Let's jump into the seven ways, Joe. And, and I have to tell you that when I first you know, read these seven ways, they really struck me because we live at a time now where we need to be more interconnected and interdependent on each other. I mean, there's just so much change and you cannot go at leadership alone. And I know it seems obvious, but even more so today than ever. So how can organizations and their leaders start to transform the ways they work and conduct business? Is it the environment? We have to change the way the environment operates, the individual or both? Well, uh, I'm a big believer in both, actually. And actually, I would say two individuals. It's the environment. So what do you reward? What do you not reward? What metrics do you use? What's the context? You know, that all sends a signal to people about how to behave. Then there's two individuals. How is the leader behaving? What are they role modeling? What are they showing? How are they acting? And then, of course, those that are working day by day, do they feel connected to whatever these metrics are? Do they feel connected to the leader? Do they feel they can bring their best self to work? So you probably have to have all three, it's still two. The two, you yeah. have to have the individuals, sure. but it's actually, there's kind of three parties there. Going. Yeah. The, the institution setting some kind of guidance, the leader setting role model and example, and then the, the you know, the people working, learning and growing and actually setting the same role model example as they, as they evolve. Well, I completely agree with you, Joe. And as we talked, talked about during our prep call, I mean, we're basically starting all over again. <laughs> when you, when you have to start with both. That's a heavy lift. And But this begins with what? It's about acts of kindness. Yeah, man. Re, 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 revitalizing trust. Uh, learning, again, how to let go and help people realize that they matter because for years... As I often talk about, when you've been stuck in standardization that doesn't account for what matters to the individual, you begin to lose 
touch with the changing world around us. And so here we are, uh, very interesting times, but I also believe they're the most opportunistic in modern yeah. history. But it's hard to perhaps see that when the environment around us feels so heavy. I thought we can go through each one of your seven generous acts <laughs> and dissect both the environment and the individual as you've laid it out. So let's start with number one, generous communication. And you talk about the importance of being real to build deep connections. You advocate openness, authenticity in communication to establish genuine relationships that foster trust and understanding. So how can this shape the environment and unleash the individual, Joe? Well, it's very, I <laughs> think about this. <clears throat> Obviously, as a leader, it can shape the environment massively with whatever words they're saying, but more importantly, how those words are heard back to your individual. Because, <laughs> And I'll tell you a funny story, not funny, interesting story. This Joaquin Duato, I mentioned him already, the yeah. and j he uses two tools to think about if he's going to give a town hall, which are videoed across 100,000 people. or and, and he has friend testing and group testing. <laughs> the friend testing one, this very spot on to your point. When he got the job, maybe three months in or six months in, he asked someone whom he trusted, obviously less tenure to him, they, everyone is. So what am I? What are, what are they saying I'm saying? And they, he, his friend said, well, you're saying you want to cut costs. So I never said those words. I said, well, sure you did. And he said, what? Well, you said you want to simplify and, um, you know, and, and clarify roles and, and be more collaborative. But the simple thing, so I, what do you mean? I said, I want to simplify because we have such an ugly matrix and blah, blah, blah. Well, no, but simplify means fire people, sir. <laughs> And so he was, he meant it truly like, let's simplify the matrix, make decision-making more accessible. But they all assumed he just wanted to cut costs, which is exactly a point. And that's the opposite of, now, maybe you need to cut costs and there's times to do it. You got to manage that the right way. But it wasn't what he was thinking. He was trying to unleash the power of the individuals, not, you know, buried down in an organization. Yet he was interpreted as because of this, you know, disconnect between the the connection the, the personal connections interpreted just the opposite so you know he used it and then he'll he did another thing he does these things if he's going to give a big talk he'll get a group of people together practice it now that's very powerful and anybody could do this and he'll go and they'll say well, what did i say and then they'll play back words that he didn't use but are the huh. words they heard and he'd write that down and say oh they said this word said that word i'll use their word and they say, well, what? T tell me the whole, what was the point of my, whatever my talk was? If you were talking to your family tonight, what would you tell them? And if you realized he was off, he changed the whole thing, you know, but it was very powerful little tool to make sure that he's actually connecting to what people are hearing, you know, not whatever words are coming out of his mouth, which is just yeah. a little piece of that whole connecting personally and deeply. But even there, there's a lot of vulnerability on his CEO of a you know ninety billion dollar company. He doesn't have to find somebody to ask what are people thinking. He can go on life. You know, he doesn't have to get a team together to say, "Here's my speech, rip it apart." But he's actually, you know, I think that's pretty low vulnerability, but vulnerable enough to let it be tested and challenged. Um, that was smart. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great. It's also smart story. Yeah, Pardon me. Yeah. Pardon me, Joe. Yeah, when he told me that, I was well, I was impressed. I used to during COVID, I had what I call the kitchen table. I won't go. It had to do with my table at home, <laughs> kitchen table. We had the family and everyone talked fast, and you had to fight to get yeah. in. One of my granddaughters said, "Well, I don't seem to get in very much." I said, "Well, you got to butt your way in, and you have to have something interesting to say. If you're not interesting, why are we listening to you?" But, but I had these during COVID. I put together like the first years and different tenures, and had me just listen to them and what's on your mind. And I had really had to shut my mouth because I wanted to answer every point. And that wasn't the point. The point was for me to hear how was everyone else feeling, especially if that was a hard time for all of us. And we weren't as, you know, once you figured out Zoom, you could actually be very connected. But at first yeah. we were very disconnected all of a sudden. You didn't see anybody. Well, this takes us to, to number two, generous listening. Yeah. <laughs> uh, listen deeply to another person's perspective to expand your thinking. So in this case, you advocate for active listening to others' perspectives with empathy to broaden one's own thinking. Again, how does this impact the environment and the individual? Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's just the way you said it. Maybe I just lived it so long. It sounds like, well, that's obvious. Why do you even have to say that? But you and I both know many, many people who have 
the sense of their answer in their head. And they've done all the analysis, they've done all the numbers, and they know it's the right answer. So I think there's two impact. I mean, one, of course, if I spend the time to understand what's in your head, Glenn, where you're coming from, it shows to you that I care. And, you know, and it builds a relationship that if we need it when times are tough, quote unquote, you know, we'll be there together. So that's an obvious benefit. But I think the, you know, if you're just a business leader that wants results, the more powerful benefit is I am learning something that you know that I don't know that when I bring the two together, it will be better off. It will get a better outcome. I often like to say during to my consultants over the years, you know, engage the skeptics and uncover the no's. I like hmm. those because they're so simple. You know, if you have an idea, we're going to drive some change, go find the people who say, yeah, I'm not sure it's going to work. And the noologist aren't typically just blocking, maybe one out of a hundred. I don't know what, I, but they know something about why it won't work. This little thing, that little thing, and you've got a great plan and all this, but down there where you're not down there, but out there where you're not touching are all these roadblocks. And by uncovering the nose, and then of course, you know, dig into the why this person thinks it won't work, you solve them together. So I think it's double benefit. It should it love it. the humanity that you talked about or the kindness. And of course you get the richer, richer set of data. Alan, well, Alan Gorski said, I was at a conference and he said, he said, um, he was the chairman of J and J before Joaquin's, you know, he said, you know, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. You just have to get the smartest answer out of the room, which I thought was, I mean, this is a chairman, CEO. I mean, I thought, wow, that's a big statement, but it is a very simple statement, right? Just get the smartest answer out of the room. Well, it, this, this takes me to, um, before we get to number three, just a thought around listening. Um, I've come to learn, uh, and you've probably seen this uh, too, Joe, and so have our uh, our listeners, that people are having trouble listening these days. Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Why? Why? Because <clears throat> before it was easy to listen when we were listening to sameness. Everybody said the same things, the same words, the same buzzwords. Now we're listening to difference. We're talking about things that we've never talked about before. Some people are in conversations and they don't even know what the conversation's about. <laughs> yeah. and, and we're having trouble listening to that difference. So back to what the chairman said, I think that's what part of the implied message is. Maybe the opportunity or the best answer is within those differences. So that if yeah. we could be a more generous listener, that's what expands our perspectives in observations around what the opportunity really is. Okay, yeah. let's go to number three, generous inclusion. Be inclusive to invite collaboration and show respect. So here's where you encourage individuals to invite different perspectives, backgrounds, and ideas to the table. Again, how can this help shape the environment and individual? Yeah, yeah. You know, and even listening to you, of course, someone could say, well, that sounds just like generous listening. I'm not saying they don't all work symbiotically as you know, I've just got... Now with this, by this, I mean, first of all, it's quite important. I don't just mean DE and I, I mean different experiences, backgrounds. Like if you're, you're a leader, if you're a CEO, don't just sit there with your C-suite team and have all your meetings and think you know everything because you aren't even close to, if Joaquin has 100,000 employees and you're hanging out with 12 of them, he doesn't do this, obviously, but how is that? So I actually think by this, I mean, include people in your meetings and your discussions Include somebody that did the work, you know, the finance analyst that did the work, bring them in the room, ask them a question. So that's the same thing. You ask them a question, of course, they're going to be scared to death, but they're going to feel empowered. They're going to feel connected. The fact that they listened, and I have many people tell me this, the fact that you brought me in, Joe, and I heard everything going on, now I got the bigger picture, and you asked me a question, I want to work harder to help get to the answer. Now, I'm not implying to make people work hard, work hard, but, you know, they were more engaged in not just what they're doing, but what how it fit. So I think that is, you know, that's very important. Also, again, all of this comes back, use the word kindness, let's use humanity, it comes back to humanizing each other and humanizing the person. Um, and then the same thing, obvious benefit is you're getting more richness around what's going on than you would hanging out in your own head. And then you just, I won't repeat what you said, but all the different experiences make for a richer answer. You know, I, I've learned, uh, Joe, that, you know, we, we, what you just described um, is really about bringing outsiders in. Yeah, that's a good with, way to put it. <laughs> without making them feel like they're an outsider. And it reminds me of um, 
of what I call the five indicators to measure inclusion. One, who do you let in? Two, how do you see those you let in? Three, who do you let them be? Four, what do you let them do? Five, how do you let them do it? I've learned that inclusion is about questions. Yes. Not behaviors. And I yes. think that this is what you're teaching us is that inviting people who may not be part of the C-suite in this, in this example you've shared, but they're the people that actually get their hands dirty and do the work. Yeah. Why don't we let them in? And it's not about seeing their title or rank on an org chart. It's recognizing that they bring in the wisdom that oftentimes we're missing, especially now, you know, all this transformation and reinvention going on. So thank you so much for bringing the importance up around generous inclusion. We just don't do that enough. So with that, what tip do you have for someone who's struggling to do this or they have a leader that doesn't do it enough and they want to give them a couple of tips on on what they should consider to do it? What would you what would you share? Well, I would actually yeah, you know, it's interesting. This goes back to what you said, where things are now tipping, flip it over, right? Because the organization yeah. used to be, no, no, I'm with my people. You do your job. You do your job. It's just, it doesn't work. And I'll tell you, not a single leader goes by that practice. They go down, they engage. I would actually, usually the other problem is people don't do it because, well, they're not trained to or they're afraid to. Well, what is that person going to say? I lose control of my meeting. What if they throw me a curve? What if they ask a question I can't answer and look bad in front of a junior person? So I would, here's what I, my tip, <clears throat> whether you're yourself or whether you're someone encouraging someone, <clears throat> invite one person into a room that you don't normally invite, that feels safe to you. You know, not, so don't put yourself in a fearful place. <clears throat> and then it's very simple to your point. I wanted, you had the whole thing, which basically ask them a question, get them involved, you know, first off, greet them, but more importantly, well, what do you think? You did the numbers. What do you think? Or what is this? Number? Ask them a question and then be, have grace. They're going to be scared. They're going to be nervous, right? Probably. So have the grace to help them if you have to, you know, because you could just leave them out there hanging. Then they'll never come back and do it again. And what did you do for anybody? But I'd probably, I would argue, I mean, you have to convince if it's a leader, so oh, I don't understand. You're going to have to just, but maybe manufacture it. So there's a meeting and you've invited somebody in. You know? I love you it. I love it. <clears throat> and you ask them a question and say, hey, boss, what did you think of that? Um, but yeah, just tiptoe in. If I think it's obvious, but I've been doing, you know, I've just kind of learned it over time. But if you have to, tiptoe in. Just invite one person that you know will you believe will contribute and you find safe, whatever that word means. You know what I love about what you just said? You've encouraged somebody to create the opportunity. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I love yeah. that. Okay, number four, which kind of ties with this one. The yeah. generous ally. Take chances to make chances for others. In other words, you believe that being a generous ally uh, individuals can support, empower, and champion the success of those around them. Again, how does this shape the environment and the individual? Yeah, so this is an important one. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's you know, who am I? I'm a white male, 60 plus years old, to know what this means. Other than, so I talked to a lot of my colleagues who might be in a situation or are in a situation where allyship is important. And I'm going to say, I'll try to be quick. You know, first off, you can be a button wearer, you know, Black Lives Matter, Pride Month. Maybe that's good. I don't know. At least you're wearing the button. But what is that doing? You know, secondly, you can be a performative ally, which is someone said, hey, Glenn, you need to have three people of this background and two of that background on your team. Get the numbers done. You don't care. You're not, you just get the numbers. My friends say, well, that's fine, but it's not. But a, a real ally, they like to use the word action ally, is someone who opens the door for others to have opportunities. And very importantly, they walk through and they deliver or they don't. You don't do it for them. They yep. you know, too many, too often people say, oh no, yeah, I'll get you in there and then I'll help you. You coach, you give them your best 5%. You don't run when things get tough, which often happens. So that's really what it's about is opening the door for opportunities for a broad set of people. Of course, to our conversation earlier about the, the value of diversity and all the different person, personal backgrounds, that becomes obvious if someone starts to have a chance to perform. The other thing that's important, I think, and this I was reminded of this over and over, as a leader behaving that way, you send a big, big signal around the organization that that's the way this company or organization or team or what it could be anything. That's the way this group is going to operate. We're going to open the door for everyone to have an opportunity and not be whatever you know structural 
barriers exist in the past to continue. Joe, I hope that our audience is picking up a pattern here. <laughs> and at least, again, I'm picking it up as I'm speaking with you and listening to the stories is that the more generous we are, the more we can see, sow, grow, and share opportunities. Generosity creates opportunity. Yep. <laughs> Whether so, that's, and so you're, you're, what you're doing is you're planting a lot of seeds in the harvest and you just don't know what seed's going to grow. But the more you practice these uh, heart led generous acts, uh, the probability uh, they will grow a harvest. So let's go to number right. five, <laughs> generous development, validate strengths and success, identify it. Oh, here it is. Expansive opportunities, right? <laughs> you, you, ex you emphasize Joe, the importance of reinforcing positive behaviors and accomplishments to boost confidence and motivation. Again, environment, individual. Yeah. So this one, this is important. I mean, the whole premise here, you just said it. See, so what was it? Re I mean, you want people to grow and develop, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, right, right. And you're planning. But this is important because as a leader, I think all of us believe it's also your job to help other. That's, I mean, yeah, I don't know what kind of organization it is if the leader doesn't believe they're supposed to grow the other people or what the metrics are in a place. So it's essential. The tricky thing here is, is first off, you have to recognize people, so recognize their, their, their wins, whatever, to build a relationship with each other so you can then give real feedback when the time comes. And I'd argue, you just say, you know, spend some time understanding what people are good at. I had someone say to me, this is a terrible story at one level, but someone said, Joe, if I put you in a room with four walls, no windows, no doors, and then this other person gave you both a tough problem, you'll probably never get out of the room. <laughs> and you have to get, he'll get out of the room. But then once you're out, if I say, let's now get it done, this other person will never get it done. You'll get it done every time. So I didn't like the part about I'm not smart enough to solve the problem, but I understood the message of you team well, you collaborate. I mean, that was the feedback to me was take that strength and use it to compensate for whatever you may be. But that's what a leader's supposed to do. He now you know that story might be harsh, but you know, take the time to learn what strengths they have. And the and then the other thing is very important. I use the word don't give mush feedback. Hey, that was really great, Glenn. I love that question. That was, is a good question. Yeah, you know, maybe you work on this part of it and that. Wait, what parts? Well, you know, the part where you said the instead of, I mean, that just doesn't help anybody. But if you've done the work, built a relationship by recognizing, understand strength, then you can give, you know, pretty direct feedback. And if it's built with care, even if it hurts, most people understand, okay, this is about me getting better. It's not about you yelling at me. Um, well, I this, one last little, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, isn't this all just about, Again, humanizing. I mean, if we don't yes. really know the person, can we really even begin to practice generous development? No, no, no. No, that's of course the point. I mean, you're recognizing strengths. You're recognizing when they have wins. You see it. You build a relationship. And then you spend the time to do the work. And this one is not so much fear. Some people are afraid to give feedback because then they'll get bad upward feedback or, oh, you won't yeah. like me. That's bullshit. I mean, that's real, but you got to get past that. That's just not helpful to you as a leader. You won't last as a leader with that attitude. Um but you're really, to your point, you're just, you're humanizing each other. And then, you know, with the care that's built, you can be direct. I had another person work for me who's in Europe, very successful, came to the United States, was underperforming. He was a senior person. Hmm. And if he was struggling over it. You could tell he's a high performer. And finally, we're sitting down one day and I said, well, you have three choices. You go home, you quit, or I fire you. Which one? And everyone's, oh, how could you be so blunt? How could you tell him that? Well, he's, oh, Joe, thank you. I've been thinking about this. I'm losing sleep over this. Actually, I'll pick, you know, go home. He went home and he says, but I just put out there very directly because I had thought about it. I knew, what, you know, I thought hard about where he's coming from and what he's feeling. And I just freed him to actually admit, you're right. It ain't working. I got to go home. Everyone thought that was, oh, that's so harsh feedback. I said, well, I don't sound pretty honest to me. <laughs> it sounded pretty, pretty human to me, but I'd taken the time to know where he's coming from, you know? Yeah, see, that's the point. It, and I think it it comes back to or comes it takes us to number six, right? What you did there was you created a moment with yeah. that individual that they're never going to forget. And they will forever be appreciative of what you did, regardless of how someone from the outside is perceiving it. 
but you call this generous moments, generous moments. And this is about making small acts of acknowledgement to uh, in important moments to make a big impact. And I know in that situation, that must have been a tough one, but I'm sure that that individual respected you for what you did. And so this is about recognizing and appreciating others through gestures, words, and actions in pivotal moments and how important this is to help individuals understand that you're demonstrating care, empathy, and support. Go deep on this one, because I think that this one is where momentum strikes when done the right way. Tell us a little bit about how generous moments help us shape the environment and the individual. Yeah, you know, you're right. Momentum strikes, and it ain't very hard, really, you know. Now, you can uh, just, I was talking to someone yesterday who actually writes a birthday card to all 5,000 of his employees. That's a big, small act, but he's got a system in place. Yeah, the cards are given to him. He does them on flights. You know, he's worked it out. So um, there's also to your, you know, just what you and I talked about. This is the most personal, personalized thing you can do. <laughs> and, and it's not hard. I mean, it's as simple as, I mean, first of all, you, well, you said it, it. You're recognizing someone as a person, as a human. You're recognizing them and who they are. And they see that you recognize them and you get all those benefits. But it's as simple as, really congratulating somebody for a job well done and maybe if you send an email or if you do it do it in front send it and copy other people copy your boss you know Mm -hmm. or do it in a meeting and call them out when their peers are around so they you know there's there's joy when someone recognizes it's fine to say one-on-one but it's more powerful if you're actually sharing that um you know thank you is a very simple thing one person told me she said, I just love it if I say something to my boss, you know, like, hey, next this weekend, my son's got a big soccer tournament. It's a big deal for me. And I really hope he does well. If when come back on Monday or Tuesday, that boss says, hey, how was the soccer tournament? That took four seconds. And then she answers, maybe it's two minutes. You lose two minutes of your day. And she said, I feel so great that he took the time to remember something I told him about my life this weekend you know, very small, very teeny act, but it humanized those two immediately. And she felt more loyal. Now you can, there's, I'll tell you what, you know, somebody, well, how do big corporate people do this or executives? Well, Scott Kirby told me an excellent story after the George Floyd killing, the murder, he, well, what the story was, his wife was on an airplane and the captain came out and said, oh, Mrs. Kirby, I'm so glad you're on my flight. So great to see you. I just love United. I love your husband. It's just a great place. She goes, well, what, what do you mean? Well, it turned out she was a black female. And he said, when George Floyd was killed, your husband called every captain who was a person of color and just checked in. No answer. No, here, do this or do that. How are you feeling? What you know we're here for you. Just thinking about you. And I don't know if he had to do, he probably did less calls than he wished he could do. But, you know, I don't know if it was 50 or 200. I never asked him. But how powerful. And all it was was a phone call. And it wasn't, she didn't have to think hard about it because he just checked in and said, how are you doing? Didn't have answers. He didn't ask HR, what you know, tell me about the blah, blah, blah. So I think these are very, they humanize immediately. They're quite easy. They take a little bit of thinking and caring about the person to actually ask how the soccer game go. But you've already talked about how the flip, things flipped over and now we're humans at work. We're not just cogs. And that's, I think it's going to get more, as I said already, you mentioned the change thinking about as reading AI will actually, I mean, some people say there'd be no jobs. I was reading another report that talks about more and more of us will become experts. And actually, you know, it, it, as long as you become, a, you, you're actually more important to the organization, but now you're still a person doing it. You're by no means just a cog in the, in the wheel. No doubt. And again, moving forward, I think that we're all going to have to reinvent ourselves to be masters of many. It's going to be expected of us. Yeah. Um, because, uh, we're going to really identify who the true high performers are. Now, on this note, let's go to the final one. And this one, I must admit, this one really struck me because number seven is give up the mask. <laughs> Joe, when I started this age of personalization movement, um, a lot of it had to do with this, you know, heart led generous act. And that was reminding people to take off the masks that they had been living with their entire lives. And, 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 and I think, you know, the way you look at this is that we've got to be emotionally accessible with authenticity and vulnerability. I think this one is the one that has the biggest lift to it because 
you believe that this allows individuals not only to embrace their true selves, but embrace their emotions and engage with others in a sincere matter. Why does number seven bring all of them together, John? Yeah, well, you know, it's, no, you're right. Because it does underpin a lot of those things up above because you have to <clears throat> let yourself be a little bit vulnerable, be more connected. I, I love what you just said. You ask people to take off or you suggest people should take off their mask. That they've you know, been wearing know. their entire life. Sorry yeah. about that, Joe. No, no, but no, but you know, if you think about it and you're not, you're saying this, you can't just ask them to do it. You have to role model, empower, enable them to. I, mean, I have a good friend, black woman at BCG, and she said, I never would code switch. I presume you know what that means. You know, I always had to be this thing and I couldn't talk a certain way. And I had to, and she goes, it was so exhausting. You know, it just was killing me. Now she figured out on her own, I can't take the exhaustion. So I'm just going to let myself be me. And she goes, it was very freeing. She goes, it was very, and by the way, my teams liked it when I was now being me instead of this code switched black person. But, but there would have been more useful instead of her spending all those years if some leader had role modeled, you know, their authentic self and enabled her to take that chance earlier than she did. And, you know, you and I both mentioned diversity, you and I both know it's, if you're a black woman, you know, being completely yourself is arguably high risk. I mean, I don't think it is really, but in our environment, it can be. So I do think this, you know, this, this, whether it's authentic or whether it's vulnerable, it enables all those uh, talking to people about, hey, what do you know that I don't know? That's a big vulnerability. You know, um, any one of these, including people you might not normally include because you're afraid of what might, they might say that you're not ready for, is a vulnerability. So I do think it underpins so many of the ability to do that stress and stuff. And, you, you know, we opened with this. You don't have to cry all the time. You can do your own version of it and find your own way to be comfortable. But yeah. our employees today are looking for human leaders. I mean, we, we talked about how technology's change is only going to make it more so people can walk. And maybe there is something different about this generation. I mean, there's a lot going on with climate and everything hitting them. So they're going to expect this from you. And, you know, the more you can tiptoe yourself, tiptoe in yourself and discover it doesn't hurt. And, oh, and by the way, I just freed others. Oh, that's pretty cool. And Joe, that's what you've done in this conversation is all seven of these heart led generous acts have created an environment that promotes inclusive working, diverse thinking and more freedom. And what it also does, it unleashes the individual to um, have a more meaningful and purposeful experience at work. Yeah. And that's what you've done in this book. You've given us the manual to not only reshape the environment, but also unleash the individual so that we can create this culture that propels innovation, initiative, and experimentation during a time of volatility and uncertainty, which again, is a time where it's the most opportunistic moment in modern right. history. And you've just told us that in order to get there, we need to be more generous with one another. And I share, so I, I share, hopefully I sum that up and respond. Yeah, that was beautiful, actually. I was thinking, wow. <laughs> because what you've done is you've really helped us realize that as big as it all feels for people, these things are self-inflicted yeah. and we've made it difficult on ourselves based upon uh, not really knowing anybody, knowing that there are people like Joe Davis out there that has all the experience in the world and has traveled the globe and impacted, I would say, a force multiplier of millions of people. And what you walk away from all this is be good. <laughs> <laughs> be human. Share, share, be share part of yourself and yeah. ultimately do what's right uh recognizing that this takes us um to act in a way that allows us to propel the highest levels of integrity and i that's what i got from the book that's what i'm getting from this conversation uh joe i really appreciate you man you've been a joy and you've brought a message that is so simple 
uh, but it's a two-way street, right? It takes all of us to kind of let go. And when you do, um, this magic can happen. So Joe, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This was really fun. Actually, just listening to you is more than about work, which you're really saying there. I mean, you've started with something about the state of our country. Just think how if we all thought about this a little bit, we could be in a different place with each other, you know. What a great way to end. Joe, all thanks right. again for your time. And as we close every show, when you lead in the age of personalization, you will see things that others don't. Do what others won't and keep pushing when prudence says quit. Thanks again, my friend. Really enjoyed my time with you today. Thank you, Glenn. It's great. Thanks for listening to Personalization Outbreak. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss a show. If you enjoyed the content, visit ageofpersonalization.com to check out our free streaming video series and learn how to get involved in the movement. I'm Glenn Yopis. I wish you a good day. And remember, without strategy, change is merely substitution, not evolution.